1992 was a fabulous year for video games. It gave us classics like Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, Wolfenstein 3D. It gave us Star Control 2, you know, one of the best games ever made. It gave us Mortal Kombat, it gave us Dune 2, and when it came to RPGs, it gave us a knockout combo. Ultima Underworld and Ultima 7, two of the best games ever made. And then there was something else. A game that was the beginning of something greater and at the same time the ending of something strange. 1992 was the year that New World Computing released Might and Magic 4 Clouds of Xen. Now it may be a bit strange to do a history piece about a game that's basically in the middle of a series without covering the ones that came before but in a way might and Magic 4 and Might and Magic 5 are their own thing. Though not exactly because the, the main plotline stretches all the way from Might and Magic 1 in 1986. But the reason that these two games are so important is that they do something that I really don't remember a lot of other video game series doing. Namely, when you have both of these games installed, they become a different game. Well, granted, it's not actually a different game, but they become one whole game, one unified game dubbed the World of Xen. And it's not just an aesthetic thing, you can travel between the worlds of these games at any time you want. You can choose which quest to do in what order you're free to go about to what at the time was massively open worlds and explore and search for treasure, fight monsters, solve puzzles. And after you finished both of these games, you realized there was still a game left, extra game. You still had to finish World of Xen itself. This was a concept that just blew my mind to the point where I started to install multiple games of the same series in the same folder just to see if any other series does this, if it's maybe some secret, something that you know, a loyal fan would see and understand and, well, it didn't happen for Diablo, I can tell you that for sure, or Baldur's Gate, though Tutu does fix that, Tutu being a mod that just puts Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 in the same game. World of Xen was an experience unlike anything I had tried up until that point, because it, it told you the story of a world, granted it wasn't a very deep world. To a point it was deep, but it wasn't sprawling epicness of tons and billions of tons of lores and codexes that you had to read, and it was, it was more constrained. But it was still the story of one world, a very strange world, one that sort of signaled the end of a very strange series. Yeah, Might and Magic continued. Might and Magic went on through another five games, five main games at least, the last one being released Oh, about three or two years ago by Ubisoft, actually, it was Might & Magic 10th Anniversary, that kind of harkened back to this style of game, and not the later ones that were all 3D and free motion and stuff. And yet that game didn't have the same charm as this one did, mostly because that game was made at the time because The Legend of Grimrock sold very well and why not ride the wave. And yet, World of Cuisine was the end of something, the end of two things. In terms of lore, story, this was the end of the Xene plotline, where the world of Xene was finally united into one whole planet, whereas previously it had been not a planet, it was a sheet of rock floating in space with two sides that weren't connected to each other. And it was also the end of this kind of just plain insane world design in terms of lore and storytelling. You wouldn't know it by looking at the Might and Magic franchise now, but it used to be utterly insane. Now it's a World of Warcraft crappy ripoff. But back in the day, 
And even, even in some of the later games, there was still an emphasis on an element that, for some reason, people despise. And I don't understand why. Sci-fi. Science fiction. Might and Magic was a strange blend of fantasy and science fiction, where you would have dragons and swords and sorcery and spaceships and nanotechnology and blasters and some people saw this as being horrible like why would you where's the consistency where's there there's no, absolutely no sense to it it got so bad that they actually scrapped the technological faction from Heroes of Might and Magic 3 and in effect they kind of uh, ruined the intended plotline for Might and Magic 8 and then 9 came along and, uh, well, we don't talk about 9, which is okay because I'm probably the only one that played it. To some, maybe the combination seems a bit like they're throwing everything together and seeing what sticks, like it's some sort of immature fantasy sci-fi mishmash with no sense of direction. But here's the thing, Modern Magic never really took itself that seriously. All you have to do is look at the intros to the games. They're, they're tongue-in-cheek, they're, they're funny, they're kind of self-aware what they are. And in the world itself, it has no more vampires as an enemy. You fight mummy dragons. You you run across the crew of the USS Enterprise D. Yeah, you find Picard in this game and everyone else. And since the GOG version does have the voice patch, you're gonna hear some gnarly voice acting. Amazingly gnarly voice acting. It had gremlins that look just weird. Like they don't look like anything you've ever seen in another game. They look like there's some kind of mutation between a carrot and a turnip with a hat. And it's amazing because it's like nothing I've ever seen before. You have giant eyeballs with wings that shoot lasers. I don't know if John von Kanigam was on drugs when he made this, but why isn't everyone else when you can have this instead of the same regurgitated goblin design you've seen since Warcraft 3 I'm gonna continue harping on that because I really dislike the design that the later Might and Magic and Heroes games had especially when they started from something as absurd as this as this thing as this thing where you fought against ninjas while you yourself could be a ninja or a paladin or a robber or a wizard sorcerer ranger and you had skills you could swim you could make maps you could do so many things now what exactly those skills did would sometimes be a bit nebulous so uh, that's why the manual was there if there was one thing this game could have needed it was tooltips and a larger drawing distance and sprites for the npcs because you go around the world and just click on benches hoping there's someone sitting there to talk to you and when they talk to you they have one line but it does tell you something about this world it tells you a secret sometimes it tells you something you can use and it gave the game a sense of exploration a sense of hey did i talk to this guy i'm gonna make my own map on this piece of paper and see if i collected everything there is to collect and secrets oh so many secrets there are so many secrets in this game that I'm not really sure if there were ways to get to most of them, so they had a button that would let you just kick down walls. Not all of them, some of them were impenetrable, but a lot of them weren't. And it's something I really enjoyed because in Mighty Magic 2, you always ran into a wall and it said solid, 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 solid. It was annoying as hell and the game had a draw distance of none, so it happened all the time. But now, solid. <laughs> Solid my foot, bam, and there's a new door. The combat of the game was as simplistic as it can get. You had six characters, they could all act in turns depending on their speed. They could cast spells, you had a quick uh, combat option that will let you just press one key so everyone did their action, the one you chose, the one you predefined, I mean. There wasn't so much in the way of tactics for combat. It was, it was kind of plain, but it's still, it's... It's kind of better than JRPGs had it, because it was faster, a lot faster, holy hell was it faster, and it didn't take you out of the world, no, you fought everything on the map, on the town map, on the world map, you fought them right there and then. But it wasn't really the combat I enjoyed, it was exploring, it was, it was finding two crashed 
alien spaceships and a volcano, going aboard and reading the logs about what happened in the previous games, but what happened to the main characters, and realizing, my god, this, this bizarre creation, this thing that marries magic and technology is fabulous. It's insane. You should have probably called it magic and technology or tech and magic, because calling it might and magic sort of makes you think that it's all about just sword and sorcery. Ignoring the fact that even in the first game you weren't in a fantasy world yet, yeah, look like one, but you are on a bit of a ship, a seed ship, a colony ship, hurtling through space on a crash course with the sun. Well, unless you fixed the problem and landed in a safe place. Enrod from Heroes of Might and Magic 2 and 3 was a world colonized by one of those ships, a ship belonging to an ancient race called the Ancients. This was actually before Stargate, so they didn't come from there and you could see their influence that influence of the ancients of the sci-fi all throughout the games up until the ninth i don't remember the ninth one having that much sci-fi in it but i didn't manage to finish it because there was a bug that uh, didn't allow me to finish it there were a lot of bugs in it actually quite a lot of them the ones that came after the heroes games and the might magic ones just had echoes of there were strange lights in the sky but nothing actually concrete and there was one more thing, one more thing that made World of Xeon amazing. Granted, I did not play Might and Magic 3 Owls of Terra, well I did play but too little of it to actually remember anything. There were puzzles. World of Xeon had a lot of puzzles, and I mean a lot of puzzles. Good puzzles. Amazing puzzles. The kind of puzzles that make you look at some of the modern puzzles in video games and think, w what happened? Did, did you hit your head and forgot the last 20 years of puzzles? Because this, this was a game that combined just about every type of puzzle possible. Well, short of pixel hunting because all the pixels look the same and item combinations because, well, it didn't have that much of an inventory manipulation system and you couldn't really combine things with the world. You just sort of picked them up and then used them where they had to be used, like mega credits. You had mega credits in this game. There were gigantic coins that you used to buy a castle and then upgraded. But back to the puzzles, they were some of the most creative I had ever seen. They were ones based on language, based on vocabulary, they were ones based on, well, logic, simple logic. You had to close a bunch of chests and when you closed one, another one would open and you had to close all of them. You had to chase down one chest through a room that always was on the move and you had to figure out the way to corner it and stop it from moving. You had to talk to a bunch of monks and figure out exactly what what they meant, what they wanted from you. There was a tower, a tower of the vowless knights, where you'll find these cryptic, very cryptic messages that seemed to be a bit incomplete. I remember scribbling through pages and pages of a4 sheets of paper, possible solutions to these puzzles, and to one in particular. One that I have seen reused in games like Lords of Xulima. It was a puzzle that gave you the password to basically the final boss's dungeon. Well, you didn't actually need it, because this being an insane world, you could go on top of the world, on the clouds, like you could walk on clouds and enter his tower, his great gigantic tower, through the top. But that that was guarded by what was it? An elemental dragon? An arch dragon? Ah, no, no, it was a mega dragon. But if you didn't want to fight a dragon, you had to guess the name of the big bad villain, the real name. And there was a dungeon where you could find it. It was in the dungeon. I won't spoil it for you. It's it's a very good puzzle, a very creative puzzle that just used everything at its disposal, which is why. A lot of games currently, potential games especially, kind of piss me off because they just waste so much potential to have interesting puzzles and not just use a piece of paper under a door, jiggle the door, the key falls out, hooray, now we can unlock the door. I've seen that puzzle done so many times, it's just making me sick. World of Xeon may not be easy to play, it's it's easier to play than Might and Magic 2 was, it's a lot more user friendly, though I have to say that the inventory management can be a bit difficult, it was before the idea of using mouse to, you know, drag and drop and move things was a thing, so you had to just 
select everything, click a button, select something else, click a button, equip, unequip and just do everything manually it, it was the worst well not the worst they could have just had text space inventory like the ultima games had up until 6 and that would have been worse world of xene is still playable i would say and it's still enjoyable it's a game that did exploration right it had an air of mystery about it probably because of all those damn puzzles amazing puzzle but still a lot of them quite a lot of them it was silly it was very very silly and it embraced it it wasn't ashamed of it and if you want to play it you, you're gonna have to buy the whole series because you can't play it otherwise you can find it on GOG for the price of nine euros and in this price you will get my the magic one two three four and five you also get sort of xene which i never actually played and you get my the magic six which is arguably the best one of the series which i never actually managed to finish but i did finish seven and that that one i liked but for me world of xene would always have a special something a i wouldn't say je ne sais quoi because i know what it is it's the blend of every one of its pieces the sheer uniqueness of it because there's probably not gonna be a game like this again most of you probably won't consider this to be any sort of masterpiece and i'm okay with that it's it's the ridiculousness of it, the sheer ludicrousness of it that made it special, that made it downright unique. Thank you for watching this show. If you enjoyed it, please consider watching some of our other videos and maybe sharing them or giving a thumbs up if you feel like it. And if you really, really liked what you saw, please check out our Patreon page. For just $1 a month, you could help us make much better shows and get some rewards in the process. Or you could consider buying my book called Tale of Doom. Volume 1 is out now and available for just two dollars and as always if you thought it was horrible you know where to find me and complain about it